I'm Hugh Yong Wong, an assistant professor in the electrical engineering department in San Jose State U. I got my PhD in 2006 from UC Berkeley, and after that I worked for 12 years in the industry before I joined SJSU in 2018. So this, I just finished my fourth years. So what, in my lab, we perform uh, physical and circuit simulations uh, to understand how the transistor works and for power electronics and also nano electronics. And we also do machine learning to uh, understand the defects or in uh, the transistors by using the simulation data, what we call simulation augmented machine learning, to build a more powerful uh, machine for machine learning. And in the last few years, I also have started working on quantum computing education and research. So there are many books that I enjoy uh, reading. Uh, but two of the books that is particularly relevant to the book I'm writing or which trained me uh, in quantum mechanics is the Quantum Mechanics by J.J. Sakura and the Introduction to Quantum Mechanics by David Griffin. The reason I wrote this book is because I studied quantum computing myself. I did not learn quantum computing when I was in the school, when I graduated in 2006, because at that time it was still not popular. Um, and in the process of this self-study, I find that as an engineer, there are some very important concepts that is not clear to us. Even I have already also studied some quantum mechanics. That's why I start thinking that I should write down my experience. Another reason is that when I joined San Jose State University, we, uh, in the EE department, there is a plan to start introducing quantum computing to the students because we know that uh, the San Jose State University students have been a very good supporter to the semiconductor industry in the past. And we think that if the quantum computing is going to be important in the future, we are going to play the same role. That's why we want to start introducing the quantum computing. So we decided to offer a class uh, in 2020 spring in Introduction to Quantum Computing. So in the whole process, then I decided, why don't I just write all the course material in a book and then we can share with other uh, students in other schools. Yeah. The reason I wrote this book is that I want to share with those people who are not good in quantum computing, particularly only have engineering training background, who doesn't have a strong uh, knowledge in linear algebra and quantum mechanics. I hope that to bring the concept to them and that's why it starts with a layperson. This layperson, the most important thing is that this layperson is willing to learn and curious to learn. So I start from the basics with some analogy and then guide them hand by hand. The first part of my book is more about uh, linear algebra, but I use the quantum computing as examples. And then they will be able to learn the, how the qubits evolve in different algorithms. So in quantum physics, every system can be described as a state. For example, for electron spin, we can say it's spin up or spin down. Or we can just have an analogy, for example, a coin, which is not really quantum physics, but let's assume it is quantum physics. It can have a head going up or the tail going up. Then you have two states. So we are very familiar with the state. However, in quantum physics, it is possible to have a state which is, is a combination of two fundamental states. In the spin case, it can be spin up and spin down. Then you say, oh, my electron can be in a superposition or a linear combination of spin up and spin down. What does it mean? It means that there's a certain probability that it is spin up or spin down. It is not definite. Just like in the coin case, if you spin the coin, but be careful, this spin is not equal to the spin of the electron spin, right? It happened that they are called spin. If you spin a coin on the table, is it head or tail? You don't know. You kind of can say that it is a linear superposition of head and tail. Now, this superposition gives us a lot of information. For example, if I have two spin, then I actually have four states. This is just like if I have two coins spinning, you can have four possible basis states. Two heads going out. The first one is head, or the second one is tail, or the first one is tail, the second one is head, or both them are tail. With two coins, you get four states. How about three coins? 
you get 2 to power 3, which is 8 state. So the number of states grows exponentially. So how big is this? We can think about this. If I have 100 electrons, I have 2 to the power 100 state. How many atoms do we have in this universe? I think it's less than 2 to the power 100. So you see that if I want to use one atom to encode one number, I can only encode less than 2 to the power 100 complex number. But I just need 100 electrons. If I can make them into a superposition, one of their states can encode 2 to the power 100 uh, numbers already. That is the power of quantum computer. So let's take a look what is a classical computer. It usually has a memory and also a CPU, which used to do the computation. And for a quantum computer, it actually is an array of, for example, electrons or atoms. And how do we do the operation? We actually would shoot some laser pulse or microwave pulse to the atom, and then we modify the state. And one of these electrons will be a qubit. So you have 100 electrons, they become 100 qubit. And that is where you do the computation.